Continuing education credits for physicians and other healthcare professionals is provided by VCU Healthcare Continuing Education. Check out cribsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information. The Cribsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and informational purposes only. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host. Welcome back to the Cribsiders. <laughs> All right. I am Justin Burt, joined tonight by our producers, uh, Dr. Crystal Nora and Dr. Nicholas Lee. How's it going, team? Great. I'm excited. <laughs> We had a fun trio here uh, talking to Dr. Brent Lynn to discuss pediatric dentistry. Lots of pearls. Uh, but before we go into the dentistry, Nick, why don't you tell us about the show today? I'd love to. We are the Pediatric Medicine Podcast. We interview leading experts in the field to bring clinical pearls, practice changing knowledge, and answer lingering questions about core topics in pediatric medicine. Brace yourself for a fantastic conversation with our guest, Dr. Brent Lin. Dr. Lin is a clinical professor in pediatric dentistry at the University of California, San Francisco. His career spans the entire age spectrum. He obtained his dental degree from Temple University and completed a general dentistry fellowship, a general practitioner uh, residency fellowship, and then also pediatric dentistry residency as well. He's currently the guest editor in the Dentistry Journal and an editorial board member in the Journal of Dentistry for Children. Dr. Lin is here to fill us in on how to give great anticipatory guidance about brushing, oral hygiene, and how we can prevent dental caries. So without further ado, let's drill into this topic. Nice. Subbing in for Chris pretty well there, Nick. Nice job. Try. And I'll start by saying, Dr. Lynn, welcome to the show. Welcome to the Cribsiders. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we're so appreciative of you taking the time to teach us today about teeth, about dentistry, uh, a very humbling topic in the field of medicine. But before we do that, uh, I'd like to start by saying, you know, we're an informal group. Is it okay if we call you by your first name, Brent? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Okay. Excellent. All right, Brent. Thank you so much. Um, and so I, I would love to get to know you a little bit better. Our listeners would love to get to know you a little bit better. And can we just start by asking you to give us a little bit of a, a one-liner kind of introduction to yourself or some things about you um, that uh, is fun to share? Sure. Um, I'm a pediatric dentist, and I love kids. I have two of my own, and I love to travel and see the world and enjoy classical music. Excellent. And uh, as Crystal has pointed out, while you're a pediatric dentist, you did some training in geriatric dentistry. You have done the full lifespan. You are you are a med ped dentist. I know, from the womb to the tomb. <laughs> 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 I, I really, you know, enjoy all aspects of dentistry. And uh, so that's why I did, um, you know, all this uh, specialty and also the fellowship. And then uh, I, you know, while doing my residency training program, I actually have a lot of opportunity working with uh, uh, other uh, healthcare provider in other disciplines, such as medicine, nursing, and pharmacies, so physical therapists. Uh, you know, as you know, geriatric dentistry, actually in my geriatric fellowship, I'm the only dentist in the program, rest of them are physicians. And uh, they are uh, neurologists, mm -hmm. psychiatrists, and for them, uh, geriatric is a subspecialty. And so, and so I kind of tag along with them, working with them, you know, most of them are interns. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, I have an opportunity working with them. And then when I did my GPR residence, general practice residency program in New Haven, Connecticut, uh, we need to work a lot with the, you know, the triage nurse and also nurse practitioner and PA down in the emergency room. And we usually, you know, they usually woke us up uh, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning for any type of dental emergency because that time the, there were not uh, oral maxillofacial surgery program in, on site for the EO New Haven Hospital. So basically anything involved the uh, head and neck trauma, uh, the, the dental GPR residence will be the first one to get called. 
And then uh, once we get called, we basically we are in house call. So uh, so it's like we you know basically triage you know is to see something that we could do. That's just a soft tissue restoration or something like that we can manage. We can do that. Uh, if there's any bony fracture or anything like that, you know, and uh, then we basically either refer triage and refer to the ENT plastic or uh, you know the old surgery in the San Rafael Hospital uh, down a few blocks from us. Yeah, so basically you know we basically you know since we get woken up by uh, emergency dental cases uh, very often and next day we are pretty sleepy when we are working on outpatient <laughs> back then you know there's no limit on how much the residents can work that time back in uh, the 90s and so basically train our uh, PA and also nurse practitioner how to, what to do when there's some you know dental emergencies come in and since then we are able to get out Sleep and all rest. <laughs> yeah, well, it's worth we'll it. have to do a, well. We'll have to do another episode on dental emergencies after this one. We'll bring you back <laughs> for right. the dental emergency training. Absolutely, I think that's going to be very helpful. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Bring the flashbacks of my where I went to medical school with <laughs> same right. and everything. But I, right. I agree that we should also do a dental emergency episode because all I know is to put the tooth in milk. That's all I know, and it's been on my <laughs> it's been on my in training exams. So. Well, it's better than some of the physician because uh, some of the time they, uh, the patient come back and we saw the physicians, you know, very do you know their he's a you know, emergency doc, and basically do their and then basically when they come in, basically we take a look, the teeth are like a trip to the wrong side, actually the backward and all this thing, and put into a socket there. <laughs> so we need to take a two side and reposition again. <laughs> But but it's kind of interesting that basically you know the front and back of the teeth are kind of, you know kind of reverse. That's wow. And, but you know but it was really fun working with the with the physician. So we work with them and tell them that you know that's the anatomy of the tooth and that's <laughs> that's the front that's the back. <laughs> so so but you know it's pretty fun. Yeah, working with the emergency doc. Anyway, I've I feel like I've already learned a lot about you, but I feel like. This is an uh, atypical question for our guests, but I feel like yeah. you have a ton of experience because you mostly work with physicians and then all sorts of other providers. So, you know, what is your, I guess, best advice when you're kind of working interprofessionally with all these people with different backgrounds and experiences? Like, what is your best yes. tip, I guess, in communicating with them? I think communicating with them is so important. And also, uh, you want to use the proper language that is, you know, that is not too in depth, you know, not too difficult to understand by other profession. Because I remember when I, I had one of the course that PD, uh, one, oh, goodness, I forgot, 190, PD 190. That's an interprofessional course that through my HRSA grant. And basically one of the most difficult thing to do is basically when I give a lecture or I'll speak during a lecture. And we sometimes we kind of not realizing that there are some uh, healthcare provider in the room who are not dental care provider. So sometimes we use dental terminology that is very difficult to understand. And so I think that's what the most difficult thing to do is sometimes you forget that you are talking to a physician and also nurse. So basically we want to use a, you know, kind of proper language and also a proper level or, or uh, you know, vocabulary that uh, actually everyone in the room could understand. And, and communication is very important also. A lot of the time we need to do a consultation. I think we work a lot with them. I mean, uh, we have physicians who actually before they do a heart surgery or before they do a transparent surgery or the patient before they go to chemotherapy or radiation therapy, they will do a dental consult before uh, they you know, uh, put patient under you know, general anesthesia. And it's kind of very important because there's a severe you know, consequence of uh, you know, uh, or dental you know, if there's a current active dental infection, uh, on their on the prognosis or on the outcome of their uh, medical procedure, so uh, so it kind of is important to communicate and work together with them. You know, the, we also need a lot of help from the uh, medical. Uh, aside uh, for example the medication that we are doing to understand you know the medication that's caused gingival hyperplasia and all this thing 
and we need to consult with them or you know the patient cannot give us a very detailed information about their medical situation medical condition or the medication that they're taking then we will send a consultation to our medical colleagues so it's very important to work with our uh, medical colleague and nursing colleagues and make sure everybody the whole team is in the same page there yeah that's awesome thank you so much brandon cool. okay. Thank One you. thing I'm always paying attention to in the dentist's office is what uh -huh. music is playing. You mentioned that you like <laughs> classical music. Do you have a yes, favorite yes. piece? Oh, that's a good uh, one. Um, actually, I um, I like the music in general. I, you know, I play violin myself, but it's been long times ago. <laughs> I used to be concert master, and uh, I remember the tune. I forgot the name of the pieces, but uh, that's a good question. Uh, this one piece that I really like is a, a violin uh, uh, piece. It's called Zugu's Vaison by uh, I forgot uh, who is the um, who is the um, uh, the the what do you call the not author, yeah, composer. but the composer, composer. Yeah. composer or oh, the, the, the piece. But that was a really beautiful piece. He, you know, has a crescendo and that's bring up and down fast pace and also slow pace. It's just really, really cool. Yeah. But, um, uh, you know, these days I just basically uh, enjoy music without knowing the name of the music. I used to know a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And well, also I enjoy uh, like restoring the antique violin because I feel like each violin has different personality and uh, because I play violin myself and uh, so I like to listen you know kind of restore them and listen to the song uh, of each violin I feel like you know they, they have their own personality and uh, so it's just very I just like to discover the sound value and the, the quality of the sound of each instrument yeah I love that I I played violin back in the day but I uh have lost any skill that I once had, but maybe, maybe I'll, I'll get it out and we can we can do the bot double together or, or some uh, <laughs> uh, duet. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. You still remember the name? Yes, bot double. Yeah, I remember the name. I remember. Yeah, the yeah. <laughs> we got it you know, for our next episode. Um, all right. Well, I have got to say, you know, we're very excited to kind of dive in um, to really address some okay. of the you know common pediatric yes, uh, yes. industry issues, and so. Um, Crystal, I'll, I'll leave it to you. Let's, uh, why don't we uh, start the first case? Yeah, of course. So we have Carrie Floss, who's in your clinic for her six-month well-child exam. Carrie is finally teething, and her mom is super excited and wants to give her an herbal remedy she found on a social media page. And she asks you for your opinion. So starting off with the basics, can you just tell us a little bit about when baby teeth appear and when they disappear? Oh, sure, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, the human normally uh, has two set of teeth in one's lifetime, uh, the primary dentition and also the permanent dentition. There are 20 baby teeth and 32 permanent teeth in human dentition. The first baby teeth to erupt into the oral cavity are the mandibular central incisor in the lower arch. They are approximately six months of age. The subsequent baby teeth will continue to erupt in a proper sequence until approximately three years of age. Uh, these baby teeth will stay in place until the permanent teeth start to come in at the age of six years older. Uh, the baby teeth are slowly replaced by the permanent teeth in a proper sequence and timing between the age of six years to 11 years. And we call this period as a mixed dentition. The baby teeth should be ex out exfoliate or disappear. Uh, what you call it, disappear by the age of 11 and a half years old. But occasionally, the timing may vary. Sometimes that the teeth may erupt early and sometimes the teeth may come in late, as there could be a variation of normal in either direction. For example, teeth could be present as early as right at the birth. Okay, these teeth are called the natal teeth. Oh, they could come in during the first months of life. Oh, we call that neo, uh, neonatal teeth because they come in during the neonatal period. Okay, are they normal? No, they are not normal. They are exceptions. The problem with natal and neonatal teeth are sometimes that they could cause issues for nursing mother 
during breastfeeding, you let sharp edge on the teeth. Or they could be very loose with the risk of aspiration. So the eruption timing is just an approximate guide and you could refer to a pediatric dentist for evaluation if the parents are worrying about their child's teeth coming early or coming too late. And I think that's, uh, that's really helpful. I remember in residency, we saw a, a natal tooth and it freaked everyone out, but there was a lot of reassurance. It was a lot of, you know, um, some counseling on, on the two biggest things that I know you mentioned, breastfeeding yes, and aspiration yes. risk. How yeah. about on the other end of the spectrum? Is there ever a time when you as a dentist would get concerned that teeth, that baby teeth have not erupted or um, are there other things that you would counsel on uh, individuals who are outside that normal range of, of teeth eruption? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we got a lot of, uh, you know, that's one of the most common uh, question or concern from the parents that, you know, my teeth, my kids' teeth, uh, basically still not coming in yet. Uh, and, uh, you know, my, the, my neighbors, you know, kids, you know, their adult tooth, uh, you know, permanent tooth already come in when they are six years old, but my child still have all the baby teeth. I'm kind of worried about him, you know. And so basically, you know, our job is actually to assure the parents that there is actually no more variation uh, between uh, uh, among the children on the you know the eruption of the teeth on the timing or the eruption of the teeth. So uh, I won't worry too much about it unless there's a you know a huge gap. For example, you uh, you know the tooth is supposed to come in at six years old and they are not coming in, and uh, and basically uh, by eight years old they are still not coming in yet. Then I will be worried about, and it could be due to sometimes it's like odontoma or some type of obstruction uh, causing the teeth not coming in, or it could be simply the tooth you know is missing. So basically, you know, our job, you that's on, only been late for, you know, within a couple of months. Our job is really to assure the parents that it's going to be okay. Uh, it should be okay. But, you know, we basically will keep continuing to monitor uh, the situation. And uh, and basically, you know, of course, you is beyond like, uh, you know, after uh, one or two years later and the teeth still are not coming in, then we will basically, you know, take a, um, you know, x-ray and do some type of intervention about it. But we probably, you know, you like just, you know, a couple months difference, uh, we probably is not going to be really concerned about it. And so may I'll, I'll take the next question, and I don't, I don't want to bogart, so you guys jump in too. But, um, you know, as a primary care pediatrician, one of the things that uh, is very common um, is this exact example of a six-month-old who's coming in and is now really fussy or drooling a lot or maybe even has these fevers, which I'm very curious to hear yes. um, your take on. But for these individuals that are, are teething, what does teething look like? What are, uh, are there any, what does a, an expert dentist say about teething and, and how, can we, how can we address this? Yeah, uh, that is a very good question. Yeah, um, teething, uh, basically, you know, it's basically related to the discomfort uh, when the, um, the, the teeth are erupting. Uh, you know, and there are uh, some symptoms and uh, maybe related to the child who is experiencing teasing, such as drooling, you know, but they are very cranky and also fuzzy. They might have a decreasing appetite and they might putting things in their uh, mouth or they have some type of red or swollen gums. But fever or crying uh, are not very typical or usual, uh, you know, for teething. Yeah, your patient actually have a fever or, uh, or crying for some reason. It could be uh, due to, you know, other reason that we need to rule out. Okay, and uh, but you know, I know there are some reports that say that kids actually you know have fever and all this thing, uh, and um, and remember that teething is a natural process. Uh, you know, it's a harmless, but may cause a little gum pain. When it happens, uh, parents will find a way to make the child comfortable. Uh, I will strongly encourage the parents to wash their hands and use a clean finger or with a piece of gauze to gently rub or massage the baby's gum uh, for about two minutes to relieve the discomfort. Uh, do it as often as needed. 
uh, you know, you could also use pacifier or something cool such as a clean damp uh, washcloth. Uh, but anything that you give to the child, you need to supervise and watch careful to ensure that there is no choking hazard. Uh, pain medication is usually not needed, but if it is needed, consider acetaminophen, Tylenol, but uh, make sure to consult with pediatrician to ensure safety and appropriate those who are such a young age. I will avoid any teasing necklace, topical numbing gels and cream and any unproven or unsafe method that might cause physical injury or choking hazard, infection or any type of health hazard. So um, so I try to stay as safe as possible. It's, you know, especially we are working with children who are uh, in the high risk or you know uh, choking and all those things, so be kind of very careful what you give to the the children. And uh, but you know, I usually like advise the parents to kind of gently rub their gum and massage the gum to make them feel more comfortable that way. Yeah, I like that. I enjoy hearing everyone's favorite teething counseling. One of the ones I, someone taught me, and and people, it's dipping the washcloth in water and yes. then putting it in the freezer and letting no. them gnaw <laughs> on the the frozen. No, not frozen uh, edge one. Edge of the washcloth. Is that <laughs> yeah. should I not be doing that? No, no, no. Don't don't do a frozen one. I, I will prefer just basically use the wet. And you want to be cool, you can put on the refrigerator, but not frozen one. And uh, you know, you want to something that's really cool. You know, you can uh, wrap the like a like an ice cube on a, a cloth and gently massage the child's uh, child's teeth. But um, just not something that's frozen. Yeah, something cold is okay, but not something frozen. Yeah. This is great. What's the um? What's the issue with something frozen? I'm yeah, learning a just, lot. <laughs> but you know, it, you know, the ice cube you when you wrap in a washcloth, it's not like frozen directly contact with the sure. you know with the 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 soft tissue. But you know, anything that's frozen, you could possibly cause the uh, like you know injury or kind of trauma to I mean to the soft tissue. And so basically I you know I don't advise and use anything frozen as direct contact with the soft tissue. Yeah. You got it. If you tell, pr consider my practice officially changed uh, Dr. Lin, I, from here on out, just the ice cube, no, no frozen washcloth. Then. Yeah, ice cube wrapped in a, a uh, like a Perfect. piece of towel and just rub it around the gum there. I just, I don't, just don't feel comfortable with. It. I mean, it could be cold, you know, basically from the refrigerator, but nothing like really frozen or such. Done. Yeah, you got it. All right. Well, once they, you know, finish the initial teething process and stuff has started coming out, there are teeth there. You know, parents are oftentimes, they're, they're smart enough to look it up, but I guess what would you tell them in terms of taking care of those first few teeth that have erupted, you know, day to day? What should they be doing? Uh, I, I think good oral health and dental disease prevention start with daily oral hygiene practice. Daily oral hygiene should start as soon as the, two, the child is born, okay? Not just after the tooth erupt. Uh, you know, when the child is born, there is no tooth present. Uh, but you can wipe the oral cavity with wet cloth to keep it clean. Okay, so you won't get fungal infection or get any kind of, you know, something grow in the soft tissue. And try, and, and as soon as soon the first tooth erupt, the, par the parents should start to brush the teeth with minimal amount of you know, or smear there or the fluoridated toothpaste. Uh, make sure to wipe away the toothpaste after brushing to prevent ingestion uh, if the child could not spit. Uh, it's important that parents to have the child brushing and frosting the teeth before the child has the manual dexterity to perform or to master this technique. Uh, before the age of three years, a smear there or toothpaste, uh, or toothpaste could be used, and after that, a pea-sized amount is recommended. It doesn't matter which brand or toothpaste to use, as long as it contains optimal level of fluoride and is approved by the ADA, American Dental Association. It's hard to describe the brushing technique in the podcast without actual demonstration, but I will do my best. Um, you know, you will hold the toothbrush against the teeth 
at a 45 degree angle and uh, move the toothbrush gently back and forth in a small stroke or in a circular motion. Uh, be gentle especially around the gum, gum, gum line uh, and brush uh, all the teeth and all the surface and make sure that uh, to turn the toothbrush uh, to reach all the angles. And uh, ideally you should brush that for two minutes and when you are done you could also brush the tongue from back uh, to the front gently. And of course uh, you know uh, we if the child is kind of when the first tooth erupt within the six months of tooth eruption you want to refer uh, the child for dental evaluation and no later than one year of age. By one year of age all the, cho all the children should have a dental home, ideally. All the children should have a dental home by one year of age. That's great. And Brent, I think you mentioned the importance mm -hmm. of fluoride. Um, yes. How do you counsel patients on the importance of fluoride as, you know, pediatric providers? Sometimes we have you know, fluoride varnishes that we can give to children in our own clinic. Yes, what yes. are your thoughts on that? And how do you counsel patients on why fluoride is important? Right, right, right. Uh, fry um, has been studied very extensively. You know, in fact, we have faculty who obtain, you know, doing fry research all throughout his career and they have become out in here. And basically, and uh, he also uh, basically uh, wrote a lot of article uh, and on the fry use. And uh, basically, fry has been studied very extensive and has proven to be effective in uh, dental caries management. And that is cost effective in disease prevention and uh, is uh, considered as a minimally invasive intervention. Uh, it's important to educate parents about the benefits of fluoride and the dental health and its me mechanism of action and be ready to answer you know, their question about the fluoride. Okay, there's a, you know, a really good article uh, that you guys actually share with me, uh, published by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, on the fluoride use in caries prevention uh, uh, in the primary care setting. And I know uh, actually all the uh, dental author in the article, and they are very, uh, I mean, they are really great uh, experts on, on this issue here, prevention and also fluoride issues. Uh, you know, it's a very good reading and uh, give a good guidance on the topical fluoride professional application as well as the systemic fluoride prescription. Uh, you know, if you look at the systemic fluoride prescription, that is price only prescription that does not require weight. It's actually based on patient's age and the amount of fluoride in their drinking water. And then other uh, fluoride containing products such as toothpaste that children should use daily to prevent tooth decay. Uh, based on the guideline and recommendation, it's advised to have professional topical fry varnish uh, application every three to six months, depending on the child's care risk assessment level. Yeah, I mean, you have fry uh, in your office, that's great. Yeah, I know there are some medical office and uh, they don't have that luxury there. So that's great that you guys have that there. Uh, the physician and nurse practitioner are able to provide topical fry varnish in you know in their office and in many states a uh, physician and nurse practitioner could get paid for the topical fluoride application uh, since children at a very young age see the physician and nurse practitioner in the medical office more often than seeing a dentist this is critical to store topical fluoride application uh, in every well child visit as soon as the first tooth erupt until the child has a dental home when the child has a dental home Basically, most likely the child is receiving the you know uh, routine fry application, you know, a professional application in a dental home, uh, in periodically. Great, um, this is really helpful, you guys. Uh, you want to go on to our next case? If unless anyone has other questions, Crystal, take it away. Yeah, so Florida is an adorable three-year-old child who's in your clinic for her well child examination. When you ask her to roar like an lion for her oral physical examination, you notice several dental caries. You ask her dads about her dental hygiene routine, and they're actually glad that you asked because they've heard that baby teeth don't matter. What are your thoughts on the prevalence of like dental caries in children, and do baby teeth really matter? 
Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah,、uh, I love the now you guys use、um, the name of the children. Now it's Rita, <laughs> Carrie's Frost. <laughs> those are very nice on those cases. Yeah, I love that. And um, basically, um, so dental caries is the most common chronic disease of childhood, and it's even more common than asthma. Many people probably didn't realize that is an infectious disease,、uh, and it's transmissible. Okay, the bacteria such as strep mutin utilizes the carbohydrate that we consume to produce acid and decrease the pH or in the oral cavity. Then demineralization or mineralized tooth structures such as enamel、uh, happens uh, with some or、uh, some long period or low low pH. The cavitation of the teeth structure will occur. The carry process is a、uh, multifactorial, and you need to have a tooth,、uh, pathogenic bacteria, substrate, and a time、uh, for the dental caries to develop.、Uh, data has shown that the、uh, nearly a quarter of the U.S. to、uh, children who are two to between two to four years of age, and more than half of children aged six years and older have caries experience. And when we talk about Dental caries experience is、uh, we we basically looking at the、uh, untreated tooth decay, filled teeth you know, with a、uh, restoration, or missing teeth due to dental caries that we call a DMFT、uh, index. Okay, children from a、uh, family with social economic disadvantage background and underrepresented minority groups have higher rate of untreated dental caries, and the increase of caries experience and untreated caries. Was statistically significant in children from the poor family. In San Francisco, here,、uh, approximately one third of the students experienced dental decay in the primary dentition by the time that they entered the kindergarten. These numbers are very troublesome, as you can see how common the dental disease in the、uh, in the young children. Also, approximately eighty percent of the dental disease. Occurred in twenty to twenty five percent of children. So we know that there is you non know, group of children who are a more high risk level of developing dental caries. And the main issue leading to this racial and um and social economic disparity in dental caries prevalence are, I believe, is difficulty in access to dental care and also some barriers such as geographic barrier, cultural barrier, and also economic barriers. For example,、uh, in some culture, I mean, I can maybe you know my, my culture, uh, they. You know, some of the older generation they may not think that baby teeth are important because they are going to fall out anyway.、Uh, we all know that healthy baby teeth are very important not only for chewing, like mastication, aesthetic, and also good quality of life, but they also help to stimulate the jaw growth and maintain the space for the permanent teeth to come in. Premature loss of baby teeth may lead to teeth shift. And space loss,、uh, there will be no room for permanent teeth to come in properly, and needing expensive orthodontic treatment or extraction to create space for the permanent teeth to come in. I first want to thank you for you know going through a lot of the the health disparities、uh, that come with pediatric dentistry, and and particularly things like access. It's something that we very much、uh, want to shine light on as a show. It's important to us,、um, and I. Think your insights are、uh, helpful, and especially de- being tied into fluoride application of what we can do as primary care providers to try to address some of the disparities for individuals who might be coming to our office but not、um, the、uh, dental's office.、Um, I I also you you mentioned I, I I learned that the most common childhood infectious disease、uh, dental caries that made sense I've never I've never heard that and thought of that and. Um, can I hear you go on a little bit more about、um, the complications of dental caries? You know, why are the dental caries bad? So it sounds like it can mess up future teeth. But if you were to let a dental carie、um, go on untreated, what are the complications? And, and maybe how do you counsel a, a mother in that or or a father to help them understand the significance of this? Yes, yes. Well, you know,、um, you know, many people then realize that they have actually.、Um, 
you know, active dental disease until they feel pain or toothache. And when they experience the symptom, uh, it's usually, you know, mean the caries process has advanced through the enamel and denting and to a point where the nerve in the pulp is irritated. Uh, without treatment, it will lead to localized dental infection or dental abscess and could potentially spread and leading to the more serious systemic complication such as uh, cellulitis, uh, you know, and you know, leading you the maxillary infection spray. It can cause cavernous sinus thrombosis, and you just spray down here to the to the head neck area. It can actually potentially compromise the airway and cause airway uh, obstruction and require the hospital admission. Uh, the dental caries we know it are compromise the quality of life due to its symptom and it's one of the key reasons that uh, the children actually or the, the student missing school. It affects the eating and aesthetics and can affect the systemic condition and medical procedures. For example, poor dental health increase the risk of bacterial infection in the uh, bloodstream and that could potentially affect the heart valve uh, and uh, therefore prior to a heart surgery a dental consult usually is sought by the surgical team to obtain the dental clearance. Uh, patient undergoing you know, chemotherapy as we mentioned before radiation therapy should also obtain the dental clearance prior to the treatment initiation. Okay, Dental caries could also transmit from mother to a child uh, or vertical transmission. And so it's important that mother or caregiver have good oral health and don't share the food items or in utensil with their children. So the, basically we need to let them know that the, the dental caries can actually is, is basically can, can not just not just affect the quality of life or uh, eating or etc. And uh, and for us as a dentist it can actually cause a space loss and leading to basically, you know, uh, there's no room for the teeth to come in or the, the permanent teeth coming ectopically. Uh, but it also uh, can actually uh, transmit uh, from provider to a children. And also uh, one thing about the dental caries insurance uh, is that the uh, dental caries is actually a previous dental caries experience uh, actually correlate with the it's one of the 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 you know strongest predictor of the future caries. So uh, so it's important that we have a good uh, you know like a dental uh, basically health. Uh, so we can the ch child can actually maintain and continue to have, maintain a good oral health throughout the life. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. One thing that um, I'm really curious is you work with a lot of medical students and mm -hmm. people who are not dentists. How do you teach them to approach the exam for a child? Um, one of the things that I have difficulty sometimes as a pediatric resident is trying to get the child to open their mouth and let me actually examine. Do you have any <laughs> tips or tricks into how you approach the pediatric dental sure. exam? Sure, absolutely. So uh, basically when I, in UCSF actually, I, uh, create a protocol, a clinical protocol that uh, medical students and also physician they can use. And we know how busy our you know medical colleague and nursing colleagues is um, in the well child visit and they cannot spend a lot of time in the oral cavity assessment or caries assessment or anticipatory guidance. So we try to make it nice and simple and we want to have everything done uh, within you know one and a half minutes. You know, so it's not going to take up a lot of time. Yeah, and majority of this thing that you can do is basically can be done by your like a nurse practitioner or your PA working in your office. Um, so we have developed this protocol, and you know, and some of them are on the forms there. The parents can actually fill out, and most of them actually uh, can fill out uh, in the form. And uh, it's the actual you know time spending with child uh, is actually you know quick screening. You know, you the kids actually very young, they won't have that many teeth present, and so you can do a quick screening in couple seconds. And uh, especially when they cry, 
in order to for them to cry, they need to open their mouth. And so you can actually do a really quick peek and then see where the you know, carries are or anything abnormal, you know, in the growth, in the soft tissue, etc. Or, you know, look at the, their oral hygiene also. And also uh, spend some time, I think the most time that you will spend on the you know, dental side is more like anticipatory guidance to go over things with the parents. Uh, based on the data you collect from the curious assessment and the form that they fill out and also and also the clinical funding that you have. And that part will take you about you know, less than 30 seconds. And then topical for application will take you another less than 10 seconds to do it. So you can actually do the dental component. You organize in a certain way. It can be done within one minute and 30 seconds. Yeah. So uh, for a child who actually you have difficulty to get them you know, open their mouth. I mean, not just you, we also have difficulty to get them to open their mouth. But, you know, um, basically, you know, there are a couple ways I would suggest that basically, you know, uh, make sure that the kids are in a very, their comfortable position. You can actually, uh, for a very young, young child, we basically, sometimes we do something called knee to knee or lap to lap exam. And so basically the child's head will be on your lap. And also you basically, and then the, they will straddle, uh, the, you know, with their leg, leg wrap around their parents. And basically the parents control their, uh, hand and their arm. And, uh, you basically kind of control their head. You know, the best way I usually, the one of the trick that I usually do is I have, uh, I have a toothbrush. And, you know, toothbrush is a very familiar object for them. You know, when they see a toothbrush, they probably, some of the kids, they automatically open their mouth. They know what to do with a toothbrush there. And basically, you just pretend that you are going to brush their teeth and other thing, and just brush the teeth. And basically, and then while you are brushing the teeth, then brush, brush, and you can sing along while you basically do a really quick exam in the oral cavity. And then sometimes the back of the toothbrush, you know, the, the plastic handle of the toothbrush can be actually kind of like a mouse prop to help you to, you know, when the child bite usually it's soft, so it's not going to cause much da uh, or any damage to the teeth, unless the tooth is very loose. And just basically with that, you can actually kind of open the mouth very quick and do a very quick examination. But, you know, we've, I found that brushing with a toothbrush uh, and it's actually the best way to have the child open their mouth. And so, uh, so and then you know, do a knee to knee exam, you know, for a very young child, you know, like a, a toddler uh, who is not, you know, who will cry. I mean, kids, they cry. It's, it, we know because we all work with children. And uh, so it's kind of normal when they cry, they will open their mouth really big. And then you can really do a really quick exam assessment and all this thing. And uh, and sometimes you can even see their tonsils uh, when they cry. So it's like really, you know, you can actually really do a really good evaluation of the oral cavity when they do that. And, um, and you, you know, they can, uh, I mean, you, they are kind of big. Uh, you can actually, I, you know, have them, uh, lay down on the, your examination table, the medical examination table. And, uh, you know, some of the pediatric dentists actually, you know, does not have, uh, a dental chair. They actually have a table, uh, you know, like a medical exam table. And they perform most of the dentistry there for children. And they just lay flat. And so basically you can, you know, and have them open the mouth and, uh, just do a really, uh, quick evaluation. And if the child is really scared and really don't want to lay on the, your, you know, medical examination table, or, and they are too big for, to do a knee to knee exam, and what you could do is basically have them sit on, you know, on a regular chair, your, your chair, maybe even your chair, and then have, oh, they stand on the corner of the, the room and have them open their mouth and just kind of take a quick look. And, uh, basically, uh, and then most of the time, they will try to help you. Kids, they want to help. And you, they're standing in a, in sitting in a position that they are comfortable. Sometimes they will try to help you also. So, whatever way you could get them to open their mouth, that'll be the best. Yeah. And, um, so, uh, when you apply the fry, sometimes they don't like you apply the fry on their mouth. So basically, you can just say, you know, this fry, uh, you know, vitamins for your tooth. They are nice, make your tooth nice and strong. And so that's going to apply some of this vitamin on your tooth. And then, uh, and then, you know, they, uh, most of the time they are pretty receptive of that. Yeah, it's going to be a bit sticky, you know, not as comfortable, but, you know, it's make, going to make your tooth nice and strong. Those are all really wonderful ideas. And I, I like how you focus on the child's comfort 
um, yes. and trying to make use familiar objects like the toothbrush or even singing a song to make them feel yeah. a bit more at ease uh, when doing the oral examination, which can be a pretty scary time for a lot of kids. So those are some really great, um, some advice that I'll look forward to putting in my next well child exams. So we, we've talked about a lot about why dental caries are bad, and we talked a little bit about how to find them essentially in your in a child's mouth, and those are amazing tips. But I just want to step back a little bit, I guess, and talk a little bit. We talked about, you know, fluoride application and what other ways to prevent dental caries. And, you know, as more of a pediatrician and we talk more about feeding, we talk a little bit about like stopping feeding overnight when they don't need it nutritionally anymore. Um, but I guess what are, what are your thoughts on how to reduce the incidence of trying to prevent dental caries? And like, what, what do you tell families and what would you like us as pediatricians to kind of focus on in our well child visits so that hopefully we can, you know, have a, have less of them happening before they get to you. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, dental caries is actually an infectious disease and it's preventable. In order for the disease process to occur, you need to have a tooth. You need to have a pathogenic bacteria, a substrate, a uh, time for it to occur. Okay. So of course you obviously want to preserve the health of the tooth. But you could disturb the other three factors, such as reducing the pathogenic bacteria, reduce the frequency and duration of sugar intake, or tipping the balance to a favorable condition or environment for the healthy tooth. Uh, you will have a positive effect on the dental caries prevention. Okay, the caries risk assessment you now is very important. It could tell a lot about the risk factors that the parents need to be pay attention to, okay, that they can address too. So, you know, there are many factors. You look at the dental care assessment, you know, you they check this and this and that, and then basically you say, oh, there, there we go. You basically, the, the, the child drink too much uh, juice, they need to reduce the amount of juice. The care that the, the child is actually snacking too often, and then next time we want to see this improve. So this type of uh, you know motivational interview, make sure they actually also make sure they can actually get uh you know don't don't give them a lot of things to improve. Maybe one thing or two things at a time, see if they can improve uh, subsequently. Okay, the so the caries risk assessment is so important. So you will know what risk factor that the parents should pay attention to. Uh, for example, you the medication that a child is taking that reduces the salary flow. It could potentially harmful to a child's oral health and increase risk of dental caries. So we might want to work together to see if we can find alternative or maybe alter the, the dose of the medication so it won't cause uh, a dry mouth, you know. And uh, then daily oral hygiene practice should be performed twice a day and it should be performed with assistance from parents before the age of six years old. Uh, and uh, when the child reaches an age with manual dexterity, usually when they start the uh, grade school, like six years old, then the parents should can transfer transition to monitor and supervise the child in brushing and flossing. Okay, uh, but before age of three years of age, use just a smear layer of fluoridated toothpaste. And when the child is older, you can use the pea-sized amount uh, that is recommended. Uh, 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 that is actually recommended. The pea size amount uh, is like a maybe quarter inch amount, and it delivers approximately 0.25 milligram uh, of, uh, of fluoride. Okay, and then drink plenty of the water. Okay, don't drink carbonated sugar drink, and limit the amount of juice. You know, 100% full juice. Uh, to about four to six ounces per day, and eat healthy food and reduce and the uh, frequency and duration of the eating sugary stuff, uh, use sugary food and snacks. Okay, you know it's not really the uh, how much did you eat the sugary or uh, food or you know snack. It's like it depend on how frequent and also how long is those snacks stay in your house uh, in your, and uh, so uh, so you the tea is constantly exposed to the snack etc is actually is not good okay so uh do not share you know the mom should not do not share uh utensil or food uh between uh, between the caregiver and the, the child and it's important to go over the anticipatory guidance uh, based on the care issues assessment and also clinical finding and lastly lastly ensure the child has a regular dental home 
and evaluate by a dentist periodically and have professional application or topical fluoride therapy. This is great. I, I guess I have two questions. So one is that is the carries risk assessment, is that like a tool that we could yes. print out and put in our office? Yes, uh, absolutely. And a lot of this uh, carrier risk assessment, uh, that tool, that piece of paper, you can actually download from the AAP website or AAPD website. And they have age specific. I think I believe there's one form from age from birth to six years old and six to, you know, an older. Yeah. And basically, uh, majority of those things that your nurse, uh, practitioner or your uh, PA can actually do it for you or the parents can actually check you know they can just check through the box and you can just take a quick look to see you know uh, what they check on the, the form actually I, I believe the form that's used by the medical profession are pretty easy compared to the dent, dental form there so uh, so it's pretty straightforward very easy to use and just go through the form and then that's gonna it's kind of a tool that we can use and uh, basically can identify the Factor the risk factor, uh, for the uh, for the dental caries. Yeah, so basically, yeah, uh, that's something that you can use and uh and in the in your office, and uh, it's a, a very um effective tool, uh, in identify the risk factor and also improve the uh, dental uh, health. That's awesome. We'll link it to our show notes, and then uh, it sounds like a great QI or just project for anybody to yeah, incorporate absolutely. that into their clinic. Um, and my second comment was really just, is really a comment. Just like, I never knew that you could transmit the bacteria that cause caries from like mother or father sharing silverware with yes, the child. Absolutely. So that's and super it's called a, yeah. wild. And it's and, called vertical transmission. And uh, so, uh, and basically, you know, we try to, uh, you know, to prevent the, you know, the premature or early transmission of the bacteria from the caregiver to, or, uh, to the, to the child. And we also, uh, you know, there's also horizontal transmission, maybe between a sibling and all these things. So it's basically, uh, it's kind of important. You try not to introduce the bacteria, uh, into the child's oral cavity. You know, try to you know, delay that process, uh, as, uh, as long as possible. But it sounds like pretty much all adults or younger children or older children, sorry, rather, are, are colonized with this, right? This the yeah, sure, mutant. That's pretty common uh, pathogen. But the thing is, you know, you they are there long enough. They have this uh, selection process. The dental, you know, we talk about the the you know the dental plaque and all this thing, and basically it's going actually uh, cause uh, you know producing acid, and uh, basically the selection will uh, lead attract more acid producing bacteria to the, the area, the dental plaque. And basically it's going to just you know, produce more and more um, you know, acid and then therefore lower the pH and cause the, uh, and you list the pH is lo uh, low and also long enough, it can cause cavitation in the teeth. Someone once told me that's the reason that sodas were so bad was that it combined the acidity and the sugar. Is that right? That that Coca Cola or that oh, sodas yes. are are bad because it's that bad combo of both the sugar and the acidity is yes. a double whammy for teeth. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So that's why <laughs> we stay away from the Coca Cola and all those uh, soft drink and you know, beverage and carbonated sugar drink. Yeah, we try to stay away from them. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to ask. You know, we focus on treatment a lot as as clinicians, and I'm always curious what the expert does when the patient is in front of them in the, in the specialty clinic. So if I have a patient with a dental carry, I refer them to a dentist, I get them set in, they come to see you in your clinic. Um, what is the treatment of, of dental caries? Can you tell me a little bit about what you sure, look sure, at absolutely. to determine and, and, you know, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, that's great, you know, to look at uh, all of this, you know, aspect and also, you know, from all the uh, uh, clinic, what they are doing. Can kind of understand you know the the backstory about this, and I think that's great. Uh, you know, in a pediatric dental setting, we uh first you know when the patient come in, we first need to do a 
full evaluation and assessment of the patient, such as take a detailed medical and dental history. And we also look at the chief dental complaint and also uh, assess the child's caries risk level and perform a very thorough uh, extraoral and intraoral clinical examination, as well as a dental radiograph assessment. And from that, we derive the diagnosis. You know, for pediatric patient, we also evaluate the child's uh, dental uh, growth and development, and also the eruption sequence, and also timing, and also orthodontics need. Okay, we evaluate the child's behavior, and then this is unique in pediatric uh, uh, patient. We evaluate patient's behavior and their cognitive development, and also we form a treatment plan. Okay, if the child is actually, you know, well behaved, we might do something that's more like a, you know, extensive, you know, to start with. And if the child is actually behaving is a little bit more, you know, like a questionable, then we probably will start something easy to desensitize their uh, experience. Uh, and then we, and before we, you know, we have need to have this treatment plan before we communicate with parents about proposed uh, treatment, you know. Uh, plan. And uh, we also provide dental anticipatory guidance and discussion, and such as uh, daily oral hygiene instruction, dietary counsel, and also trauma prevention, for example. And we do that based on the child's developmental milestone, and we implement a preventive strategy for each child. Uh, before the child is discharged from our office, we do a dental cleaning uh, and, and also we uh, apply the topical fry varnish. Uh, it's depending on child's dental needs, we will schedule uh, the subsequent dental visit accordingly. Uh, the management of dental caries varies depending on the severity and the extent of the caries risk level. And from minimally invasive therapy, uh, utilizing like a chemical agent to reverse uh, the caries process, such as prescription string fluoride therapy, to preventive measures such as the sealings, uh, or preventive resin restoration, to something more extensive restorative treatment such as amalgam restoration, composite restoration, and stencil crown. Uh, and for more a severe case when the dental caries extend to the pulp, uh, we can we might need to perform root canal therapy and or oh, extraction. You need that you know you the tooth is necrotic or cause the dental abscess or non restorable. So we basically provide uh, all the you know uh, basically treatment uh, treatment modality will be based on what condition where the caries stands uh, and uh, in the uh, in the process. Yeah. So uh, so it's basically you know uh, our main goal is to save the tooth, but sometimes we just cannot do well as much as we want to save it. The best thing to do is actually take the tooth out because you, you leave the tooth there and now you, it has a poor prognosis, it may can cause problem with the you know with other things such as bone loss, etc. So basically we do the best we could, uh, but when there's time the teeth cannot be safe, then we will inform the parents and take the tooth out. Brent, this has been amazing and, and very helpful to go from uh, preventing, identifying and treating uh, dental caries, the most common infectious disease in, in pediatrics. Uh, what are some of the, the key takeaway home points that you want our listeners, whether they're students, residents, or independent practitioners, what from a dentist do you think is some of the most important things that um, medicine clinicians and pediatricians should know? Yes, yes. Actually, um, and you know, I always like to tell my uh, you know, medical student and also my um, like a nurse a nursing student. Now, uh, the main take-home message for them after you know the the my lecture, uh, my first lecture, actually are the dental caries. Remember, the dental caries is preventable. Keep that in mind. Dental caries is preventable. It's not necessary it need to be occur. Someone can have could be caries free all their life. You know, if they do a proper measure. And uh, also. The second point is that medical and nursing primary care providers are way more likely to see children before their dental visit. 
and therefore they have the best opportunity to assess, to prevent the dental caries from happening, to provide anticipatory guidance, and to detect dental disease in early phase, and to refer them for a timely intervention or refer them to a uh, dental home. And lastly, we need to remember it may be too late by the time that they seek to a dental care. We saw some kids, some, you know, they are only two or three years old, and they're all their teeth are bum out. That's basically this, all, every single teeth are caries. And we need to, in Texas, we actually seen children that we need to take out every single tooth. And uh, in California here, we have need to do, every single tooth need to be taken care of, either need to be extracted, need to be pulled, or near to her baby look canal and crown place. So it's really, really sad to see this thing happening. You know, if someone somewhere could just at one point just lift up the lip of the child and take a quick look, they can just refer to a dentist for a timely intervention. And the child is not going to suffer so much and it's not going to be, it's not going to have this cost, very costly treatment done under uh, um, you know the general anesthesia in the operating room and also you know basically it's not going to compromise their quality of life so you know just when a child come to your office for a well child visit just live you know you, you are very busy just live up their lip and take a quick look and see what you they have some issues and refer, refer them to a dentist uh, for proper intervention. And also try to apply fluoride varnish. It's very easy to do, uh, topical fluoride varnish, um, it shouldn't until they found a dental home. Because, um, you know, we cannot do all. Uh, you know, there are some area, especially in the unserved community, there is no dentist, so there is no dentist participate in, um, you know, the state uh, assistant program. And so basically, um, they just don't have access to dental care. So it's very important that uh, our, you know, you, you know, our, you know, physician and medical uh, uh, colleagues that basically, you know, can help to prevent this, uh, these issues, the dental, you know, high prevalence or the dental caries, especially among children in the underserved community. Absolutely. Just lift up the lip and do the varnish. I love it. <laughs> I, um, is there is there anything that you'd like to plug or any resources that you think we yeah, should direct yeah. our listeners to? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, uh, again, I just need to emphasize it again. I believe to address this high prevalence of dental disease among children and oral health disparity, especially those in the underserved communities, you know, those socioeconomic disadvantaged family and also underrepresented minority groups. Dentists alone could not get it done. Okay, we need to work together with our colleagues in medicine, nursing, and other healthcare discipline to combat this issue. The rural primary care provider are so critical, and the oral health assessment should be incorporated into every well child visit. You, you need to you know, more practice, you know, practical guide guys. There are two C article that I wrote in uh, two thousand nine in the dimensions of dental hygiene, that will be helpful. Okay, it's, you know, it's Lin B. P. J. The title for one of the articles, Our Youngst Patient, and the second article is Starting Our Right. And it's the journal that basically, they have two parts. And basically, uh, and, uh, they give that, those two articles give a lot of practical uh, idea, guideline, and how much, uh, what amount of toothpaste to use in each age. Or you know each stage of the child's development, and uh and it's uh it's actually the the journal is called Dimension of Dental Hygiene, and it's published in two thousand nine. I think volume seven, uh in number seven number five. So basically, you Google it, you can actually look into the Dimension of Dental Hygiene and put down and just Google my name and also that journal, and you should see some of the article pop up. And also, you could also Google my name on some of the scientific articles on the interprofessional oral health training. Yeah, we actually published uh, uh, some article on the interprofessional oral health training uh, based on our work with the HRSA. So, you know, you need it. I can actually send you a link to our uh, to this uh, article and so we can post in the podcast. Perfect. Yeah, we'll put it in the show notes. We'll, we'll share it with 
with the world. So thank you for <laughs> those resources. Thank you for, for sharing them. Thank you for writing them. Um, it's really appreciated. Great, great, um, great, Justin. It has been uh, really tremendous having you. Thank you so much. This has been uh, very helpful. I, uh, I think we can all say, you know, that this was wonderful to hear your perspectives um, and get a good understanding of, of some of the challenges and insights into pediatric dentistry. So, uh, again, thank you so much on behalf of the Cribsiders Nation for sharing your time and expertise. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, coming on the show with us. Hey, thank you so much, everyone, having me in the, the show, and I really appreciate it. And actually, be honest with you, this is the first time I did uh, I do the podcast. So, oh, you crushed it! You're great. Yeah. Pat my back. You uh, crushed it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, Crystal. Yeah, you guys have a nice holiday break, and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Okay, excellent. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, take care. This has been another episode of The Cribsiders. It's for the kids. Get show notes and sign up for our weekly knowledge food formula feeds and newsletter on our website at thecribsiders.com. We're committed to providing you with high value practice changer knowledge. To do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, review the show on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player and contact us at thecribsiders at gmail.com. A special thanks tonight to our producers for this episode, Dr. Crystal Nora and Dr. Nicholas Lee. Thank you to our wonderful social media team on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I have been Justin Lee Burke. I've been Crystal Kanto Chukwu Nora. And this has been Nick Lee. Thank you and good night. <laughs>